answer session. To ask a question, please type your question into the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll just to answer your questions, but please understand that this is a very large webinar, so your question may not get answered. If you have any technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-29-3239. Again, 1-866-29-3239. Understand that there are some technical issues you may not be able to resolve. For this reason, we are recording this event and will be posting the recording to our website within a few days. Today, our presenters are Linda Rosenberg, Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, Phil Diani, Court Executive Director, retired from Delaware County, the Honorable Judge Zatola, Judge of the Allegheny, Count Court, Allegheny County Court of Common Pleas, Criminal Division, and the Honorable Dilla Wood Skipper, Supervising Judge of the Philadelphia County Court of Common Pleas. Um, our first speaker, who will be introducing everybody and giving you a little bit of some background, is Linda Rosenberg. Linda Rosenberg is the Executive Director of the PA Commission on Crime and Delinquency. She's appointed to the position by Governor Corbett in March of 2011. Linda has over 20 years' experience working with practitioners and policymakers at all levels of government to improve the Commonwealth's criminal justice system through interagency cooperation, planning, and the development of enterprise-wide criminal justice solutions. We're very excited to have this group today, and I'm going to turn it over to Linda. Thank you very much. I'm, actually, I'm thrilled to, to be participating in the webinar. Um, the, the goal of the webinar today is to talk about how um, I'm able to support innovation in large counties who have been able to implement really collaborative efforts, how they've been able to bring people together, how they've been able to get them to really come together with a common vision and then implement very, very effective programs. So we have uh, Phil Damiani, and he's going to talk a lot about the work they're doing in, in building strict, uh, County planning boards and strategic planning efforts. Um, uh, Judge Zatola is going to talk about the work they're doing in Pittsburgh and Allegheny County to establish a mental health court and a veterans court. And Judge Wood Skipper in Philadelphia is going to talk about the work she's done to establish a, a mental health court in their county. The Commission on Crime and Delinquency is a state agency in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We're really the criminal justice planning and policy making agency for the state. And the administrator, the AAA, for the majority of the justice assistance funds coming out of the Department of Justice. We administer funds for um, criminal justice programs, for juvenile justice programs, for victim service programs as well. And, and really, what the Commission does very well is we bring together individuals, practitioners, policymakers from all levels of government. We have um, justices from the Supreme Court. We have um, Judge, judges from the Court of Common Pleas, we have DAs, we have um, state police officers, we have local law enforcement, police officers from both the county level as well as the state level. So really our goal is to bring together everybody who really has an impact in the justice system and to talk about really what the system-wide problems are and to help come up with various solutions to address those problems. And then use the federal funding that we receive and some of our state funding to, really to address some of those problems and to try and implement different types of innovative solutions in addressing those problems. And then we um, measure um, with outcomes the effectiveness of each of those different um, systems that are implemented. It really serves as a, a criminal and juvenile justice center for excellence. And we, we do a research, we do a lot of policy planning, uh, technology implementation of different technologies, as well as outreach and other support type services for, for the Commonwealth. We also oversee about $100 million in state and federal funds for victim service programs, criminal and juvenile justice programs. Um, we support nonprofits, um, academia, and uh, local government, all to help improve the administration of, of justice. Uh, and we say one of the um, primary responsibilities of the commission is to really look at really the, what the needs of the criminal and juvenile justice systems are and to develop and implement policies and procedures to improve the operation of these systems and to really support all units of government in their efforts to improve these systems. And we're able to do that is really through um, local planning by bringing together individuals from all different facets of, 
of the criminal justice system and juvenile system to really look at uh, developing a team approach to problem solving. And, um, and one of the initiatives that we've supported in the past is we call them county criminal justice advisory boards. And we've used our federal funds to help the counties to establish these criminal justice advisory boards to implement different types of um, tips with the support of these federal funds. One of our re most recent initiatives is the development of strategic plans for each of those criminal justice advisory boards, and then now the development of dashboards to help support them in their planning efforts. Uh, the commission, we have an, over, an overall commission. They're appointed by the governor, all the members of our commission. Um, and then we have two key committees that we're going to talk about today. One of the committees is our mental health and justice Mental Health and Justice Advisory Committee, and that's chaired by uh, Judge Zatola, who is on the call and is going to talk um, today about the initiatives of his, of his committee, as well as uh, Phil Damiani, who chairs our Criminal Justice Advisory Committee, and he's going to talk about the role of his committee, uh, particularly around the planning efforts and the Criminal Justice Advisory Board. Um, I'm going to... Um, Phil Damiani, and Phil's going to talk about some of the efforts that they have underway in his, in his committee. Phil, is a, Phil Damiani is retired from the position of the Court Executive Director for Delaware County. He held this position for 10 years, and in this capacity, he provided oversight and support for all of Delaware County Court Departments. Mr. Damiani was a founding member of Delaware County's Criminal Justice Advisory Board. He served as the facilitator and chair of its prison population and System Cost Containment Committee. Phil has over 30 years' experience in the criminal justice field. Uh, Ms. Danny Phil was also appointed by Governor Tom Corbett to the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. He's one of our commission members. And he's also the chair of the Public Safety Advisory Committee. And as I like to call Phil, he's really the father of the criminal justice advisory board and the planning efforts. And really has been a leader in the Commonwealth in terms of helping other counties to build these types of collaborative initiatives. Ed, uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's, uh, I mentioned uh, we have this uh, committee now at the state level, the Criminal Justice Advisory Committee, and uh, it's a committee. And this is a committee that's only been about a year old, and it really is derivative of all the work that the local Criminal Justice Advisory Committee countywide have done. Uh, our recent statement is certainly as consistent with uh, what we're doing with PCD, and uh, we're supporting comprehensive strategy to reduce crime, prioritizing evidence-based policy and practice at every stage of the Commonwealth's justice system. Um, and, I, and I think it's important to note it in the beginning that um, there's tremendous flow of uh, collaboration and information back and forth uh, with uh, our state agencies uh, and the counties. And uh, uh, 20 years ago, in Pennsylvania, there were virtually no criminal justice advisory boards. It's a uh, in the 20 years we've really built them uh, from very zero to almost every county in the state. Uh, the uh, the next slide that I want to refer to uh, is the uh, typical agenda for our criminal justice advisory committee. And again, the uh, statewide advisory committee. Um, is a collaboration of many individuals, key stakeholders uh, from around the state and key positions, much as Linda had talked about uh, the uh, membership of the, uh, the commission. And uh, in, in looking at the kinds of things we do, there's an awful lot of money that's done with uh, grant money, uh, prioritizing grants, uh, but also uh, looking at what we're doing to support our criminal justice advisory boards. And if you'll look at the uh, uh, general updates in uh, the uh, typical agenda, and that was August 17th of 2011. Uh, There's a lot of discussion about um, re efforts, uh, digital dashboards, uh, which are really key to uh, local uh, criminal justice advisory boards getting the kind of data and information they need on a regular basis, basis to make decisions. Uh, and uh, also in evaluating uh, the kinds of uh, programs uh, that are helping us advance uh, criminal justice in Pennsylvania. Uh, the, and I think it's important since we're talking to a, a lot of people across uh, uh, the country, the, uh, you know, a criminal justice advisory board uh, is going to take a look at what it is. And I think that um, it, it gets uh, key stakeholders, key policy levels, 
it's a systemic approach, uh, but it's a different kind of a group from um, issue-oriented or ad hoc groups. Uh, this is really trying to bring together key people uh, at membership levels, uh, at, at all levels, uh, really to engage in, in a lot of uh, information gathering and educating uh, each other. I think as we get further in the presentation today, uh, one of the big topics, of course, is um, how we communicate from different areas of the field. And we do have different languages in the criminal justice system, in our behavioral health system. So there's an awful lot of work that goes on uh, to help us to, to educate each other, to understand what we're talking about. Uh, this slide, I think it was important to, uh, uh, to share this. As I mentioned before, 20 years ago, we virtually had zero criminal justice advisory groups uh, functioning in Pennsylvania. And now, if you look at that particular chart, uh, there are uh, four different regions, and uh, each region has a representative from the PC, the uh, staff member uh, who works closely with each of all those counties. So that person is really helping to communicate the kinds of issues and important things that are happening in counties uh, in those particular regions. The regions then work together uh, to share information, and, and as I mentioned earlier, virtually every county now as a criminal justice advisory board. The, just a few of the benefits of advisory boards, uh, and, and these are things that it, it's at different levels at different counties, but these are all kind of central to what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to improve analysis of problems. If we have a prison crowding issue or something, we want to know, well, what's the data? You know, uh, why are people being admitted? What kinds of reasons? What's the timeline for how long someone is there? The improved communication, cooperation, and coordination is is very important. When we meet, uh, when our group gets together, uh, there's a, a tremendous opportunity face to face talking for people who have sidebars uh, uh, before meetings start and, and after to really uh, uh, work, work as people. Uh, we establish clear goals, objectives, and priorities. Uh, we're, we're looking all the time at producing more effective allocation of resources. As everyone knows that in, in terms of the economy and dollars, it's very challenging. So it's really important for us to uh, allocate uh, resources uh, judiciously. We look to improve programs and services, uh, and we're also trying to improve the capacity and quality of those who are working in our, our system. The Delaware County Criminal Justice Advisory Committee, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we started in 1994, and I was a founding member of that. And that was really the genesis came out of uh, some prison cleaning issues, some changes in the law in terms of sentencing. We now had the opportunity to look to intermediate punishment sentencing uh, in Pennsylvania. So there were a lot of things happening that county needed to come together uh, and develop some options uh, that we perhaps didn't have uh, prior to that. Um, as the state has done, if you look at that slide with the members, it's very diverse. And uh, what I would highlight is the uh, interaction we have, uh, both the executive and judicial branch of government. And for 18 years, they've consistently uh, been at the table, willing to work together. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to get uh, different branches of government to really uh, to work together and cooperate, uh, but uh, we've been very, very fortunate to have that occur uh, in, in Delaware County. Uh, in Delaware County, the chair's appointed by the president, judge, and, and Delaware County, uh, if people are familiar, is a, a two-way county in Pennsylvania with a population of about 550,000 people, um, meetings monthly. Uh, we make certain that we have agendas that are clearly spelled out and minutes are taken so that you have a history of where you are, hopefully where, where you're heading, uh, and the issues and items that are front and center that need to be uh, considered. The uh, committee also establishes uh, ad hoc committees as needed. Uh, we have standing committees. Uh, one of the standing committees, and this certainly ties into today's presentation, is our behavioral health subcommittee in uh, a long-standing committee that uh, works hand-in-hand -hand, uh, with the, the full advisory committee in, in terms of developing options 
options and programs uh, responding to uh, particular needs uh, in the system. Uh, the bullet on that page, uh, develop indicators to measure performance. Uh, that's one of the things with the help of the uh, PCCD that the county has been able to do in terms of developing consistent measures for performance uh, to really give us all a sense of uh, where we're heading and, and what we're doing. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, just one thing in, uh, in concluding. That Delaware County, uh, through our Behavioral Health Subcommittee and the Advisory Committee, over 10 years ago, uh, submitted a grant proposal to the PCCD it was to establish uh, four behavioral health liaisons uh, who would provide much needed interaction and communication between our prison. They would be based at the county prison. They would be uh, ultimately and, and sustained by our county in our behavioral health services and human services department, uh, but working within the uh, probation department coordinating uh, our efforts <clears throat> with treatment court, but also in dealing with the uh, mental health uh, population uh, at our county prison. So uh, that's, uh, I, I think, a nice transition and, and a segue to uh, the, I believe, the great work that uh, Judge Zatola and Allegheny County are, are doing in their courts. Thank you. Um, uh, about, about four years ago, the Department of Public Warfare um, and the PCCD really came together and to address the need of um, mentally ill individuals that were coming in contact with the criminal justice system. So what we did was we, we, had, we put together a committee and we came up with a strategic plan, and a real partnership, and the Department of Public Welfare actually put money um, in conjunction with our uh, federal dollars to help develop and establish this strategic plan. And one of the recommendations was to have sort of the standing committee that would uh, be part of our commission. And one of the benefits of having this committee is, um, is access to, uh, to federal resources. And so when we were looking to, uh, to find somebody to chair this committee, we, um, it was just a logical choice to, uh, to look to Judge Satola. He had just uh, established the, um, the mental health court in Allegheny County. And he brought some fabulous leadership to this committee and to this issue. And, uh, and we've been able to establish, I think, at least 10 mental health courts across the state um, since, uh, since this committee was put in place and uh, I'm starting to collect outcome data from each of those uh, mental health courts. We are also are looking at uh, crisis intervention training, forensic care programs, and other very, I think, innovative programs to address this issue. Uh, Judge Satola was elected to the Court of Common Pleas in Allegheny County in 1994, and he stood in the criminal division of the Court of Common Pleas from 1994 to 2011. 2004 through 2010, Judge Satola was also the supervising judge of the Allegheny County investigative grand jury. Um, for those outside of Pennsylvania, Allegheny County is, um, is where Pittsburgh, the city of Pittsburgh, um, our second largest city, is in Allegheny County. From 1996, until 2011, Judge Zatola supervised Allegheny County's Mental Health Court, which has received a lot of national recognition. Judge Zatola was also instrumental in the establishment of this court and really brought together the key players within his county to get the support and to help him get the, um, get the court underway. He's also the supervising judge of the Allegheny County Veterans Court. He also helped get that court established. This started in 2009. Since 2007, Judge Zatola has been a member of our commission, and he chairs the Mental Health and Justice uh, Advisory Committee. Judge Zatola is also a member of the Veterans and Pennsylvania Criminal Justice Task Force. Thank you. Thank you. Kind introduction. Um, I, before I talk about the uh, Mental Health and Veterans uh, Courts that I supervise and continue to supervise. I'd like to talk a little bit, if I could, about the um, Mental Justice Advisory uh, Committee that Linda was talking about. And, and as in many of these instances with respect to mental health court or veterans court, that the collaborations are collaborations among prior unlikely partners. Uh, the, 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 our committee, the MAGIC Committee, being a collaboration between DPW, Public Welfare, and, and Criminal Justice, the Crime and 
Commission, um, Crime and Delinquency Commission. It's an unlikely partnership. In Veterans Court, we also have an un another unlikely partnership in the past, having been a judge of the Court of Common Pleas, and that is the courts and the VA. But they're partners that are coming together, realizing a common and shared goal, and that is that they need each other as we go forward with these problem-solving courts, one of which mental health court is and veterans court is also. Our, our Mental Health and Justice Advisory Committee, in collaboration between DPW and the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, we saw very early on that we needed to add another partner because we identified as an issue with respect to mental health, individuals with mental health, as well as the veterans, as well as a large part of or a part of the other population housing be, as being a very, very important need. So we then began a collaboration with the Pennsylvania Housing Alliance and to add them as, as another partner as we met annually at their conference. So the collaboration among um, it's likely partners in the past is a key to, to what's taking place. As indicated, I was the prior supervising judge of mental health court and also am currently supervising veterans court. Courts are described as problem-solving courts. Examples of problem-solving courts are drug court, mental health court, DUI court, and veterans court, and the, and the list is not exclusive. Now, the question is with respect to problem-solving courts, why do you have problem-solving courts? Well, in my opinion, it's the right thing to do. The right to do when you're able to divert someone with an eye toward public safety, divert them when they're in the criminal justice system, and be able to treat them when they have a mental illness or they're a veteran that's suffering from possibly a mental illness or PTSD as well as traumatic brain injury. So it's the right thing to do. The second reason is it saves money. Um, Mental health court was created by or was funded by the legislature. The legislature wanted to find out what it would cost, what it cost the taxpayers to fund these types of courts. So they commissioned a study and they had the Rand Corporation do a study of Allegheny County's mental health court. And in a report that was published in either 2007 or 2008, the Rand Corporation found that over a two year period of time, um, Allegheny County's mental health court saved $3.6 million. Um, so it's the right thing to do, and it saves money, and it's effective. As you'll see later on, our recidivism rate, although our numbers are, are internal, but I think they're fairly on, our recidivism rate is about 15% compared to about 65% uh, in, in the traditional criminal justice situation. Involving court is a non-traditional uh, approach to, to uh, justice issues. Um, if you look at a traditional type of court, it's a it's a of almost a vertical approach where you have both sides, both advocates arguing their position to the court, and the court makes the ultimate determination. The problem in court is non traditional, where it's a horizontal, that is a team approach to the resolution of the matter, where the judge, if necessary, acts as a speed bump in making the determination as to what the ultimate decision will be. And I'll go through a little bit further in, in the slides here. The examples that were put together by Judge Roger K. Warren of the differences between the types of approaches where a traditional pro approach is dispute resolution, a transformed process, problem solving dispute avoidance. You might have an adversarial process in the traditional process, and in the transformed or problem solving process, it's collaborative. And as we go down the line on the bullet points, the emphasis is placed on adjudication in the traditional process. In the reform process or transform process, it's placed on post adjudication and alternate a dispute resolution. And as you can see, we continue, we go through the, the difference between the two. And, and for me, um, this is a major difference, the judge is being an arbiter in the traditional process. And here in the problem-solving process, the judge is a coach, social worker, cheerleader, case manager, a risk manager, a member of a treatment or therapeutic team, a listener, a translator, a lead actor in a courtroom drama. Now, that may not be, that not be the, the role that some judges want to take. Um, it's a role that I rest having taken on. I've been on the bench since 1994, and I've I've been involved with with capital cases in in, in multiple criminal cases. Each judge in our county handling about a thousand cases a year. So I've seen my share of important serious cases, and, and they've been good to try. But the most rewarding work that I have done, and, and I, I'm sure my colleague Judge uh, Wood Skipper would say the same, is the work that I'm doing here. In the past, in mental health court, and currently in, in veterans court, it, it, it makes a big difference in people's lives. It, it, it works. It protects public safety, and it's the best thing that I've ever done as as a judge in the court of common pleas. 
and finally they talk about the, the few other differences between the two the two systems. The goal again the county's mental health in, in, in veteran court is spelled out there in the first uh, in the first bullet point. And I see some of the important factors there are it's a county wide community based integrated system and it involves treatment for those that are in the criminal justice system while still ensuring public safety. You could see the objectives as they're laid out on the bullet points. And in the first bullet point, it's talking about, again, just related individuals and the behavioral health system. Two parts that, never, that didn't work together so well in the past. Um, and what you're creating here is ability to be able to divert people from the criminal justice system with toward public safety and get alternatives to incarceration for the individual with a mental disability or, or a veteran. And as you can see, the first, the first three or four bullet points are the part that I talked about in the past where the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do if you can, with an eye toward public safety, divert someone from the criminal justice system. Um, the other bullet points talk about the, the last two, uh, and those, those are the issues that it does save money and it, it, it does work. Is made up of the district attorney, the public under office of conflict counsel, just related services, which is human services, a probation officer, and uh, for our veterans court, it's a veterans justice outreach worker. Um, the additional team members are a, a peer mentor for vo both in health court and in uh, veterans court, uh, a local nonprofit, which is a veter veterans leadership program, and in mental health court, there are another player is the community treatment team. Um, let's talk a little bit about the community treatment team, and as we go back to saving uh, to saving money, the community treatment team is essentially a team that provides wrap wrap around services for those with with mental illness. Now the teams are expensive and it's my belief that the teams cost our county approximately a million dollars a year and there are nine teams. But there are 120 people that are served by each team and if you multiply that by the nine and, and you do the math you're going to see that in the long run by not having people either incarcerated or not having people hospitalized but being able to treat them in the community and provide those wraparound services you're, you're saving a lot of a lot of dollars now some of the additional players and this was got back to what Phil was talking about that are part of the CJAB that supports the core players here are going to be the the members of the court are going to be your, your, your local county, your jail, your sheriff's department, the police, and the other typical players that Phil talked about. But these are the core players for the purposes of a mental health or a veterans court or any problem-solving court team. Paragraph describes what, in my estimation, is one of the most important factors um, with respect to a problem-solving court team. You can see trust is a key component. A probation officer, probation officer has to be, as well as a DA, has to be able to trust that a human services worker or the veterans justice outreach worker who is a social worker will be willing to report if there's a program failure or a behavioral problem so that if someone goes out and is a program failure or a behavioral problem and commits a crime and the probation officer hasn't been informed of that, well, they're not going to trust that other, that other, that other member of the team. Um, the same with the services and the Veterans Justice Outreach for has to trust the DA and the probation officer that as soon as someone when they find out that someone is a program failure or perhaps a behavioral problem, that they're not going to want to incarcerate them immediately and that they're going to want to work, work with them. This has to, has to be developed over a period of time. It took me approximately, once I started in, in mental health court, approximately about two years to develop some, some process to the point where I no longer had to discuss that issue at quarterly meetings. What we would do is we would have quarterly meetings outside 
of, of the court sessions where we would talk about where the court is going and what's taking place with respect to the court. What are some of the good things that are going on? What are some of the issues and some of the problems? And we've had at the very beginning frank dis discussions with respect to trust and how it's extremely important and having to make sure that, that the probation officer and the human services officer get on the same page. And sometimes those were in the discussions, but after a period of time, after a couple of years, when that trust and the, the fact that they're seeing that it's working for both both actions, if you want to call it actions, that the, the, the trust uh, discussions um, became more and more uh, infrequent. of these courts is, is, is being able to divert an individual um, in the criminal justice system. And we use something that is called the sequential intercept model that was developed by uh, Dr. Patty Griffin and Dr. Mark Butz. And, and what it, the sequential intercept model is, is it's a determination as to where are we going to intercept someone that's in the criminal justice, justice system that is either one with mental illness or a veteran. And they have five levels of intercept. The first level of intercept is going to be with it's called CIT, and that's specialized police training. The police officers are trained to be able to, when they come upon someone um, at, at the scene of a crime, to be able to perhaps diffuse the situation and be able to divert them from having to be placed in jail. Um, the, the training that we have here with respect to CIT is 40-hour training, um, and, and it's good for some departments. Uh, some departments can't afford the 40-hour training, so we are developing through our Mental Health and Justice Advisory Committee a, a, a curriculum for smaller uh, police departments, and that's called Mental Health First Aid. And we're trying to at least then be able to uh, acquaint the police officers with some of the issues to, to be looking for level of intercept is intercept two, and that's typically at the preliminary hearing or or, or in the jail itself. And um, at Philadelphia, I believe, and Judge Wood Skipper will correct me if I'm wrong. Philadelphia's Veterans Court is able to intercept is able to intercept at their preliminary hearing level, essentially. Um, what that does provide for their Veterans Court is they have the ability to intercept a larger uh, population of veterans, and they are also able to do something that, that, that is a benefit to the veterans, and that is since they are at the preliminary hearing level, some of the charges are less serious, they're able to offer the carrot to, to the veteran that if they properly do what they have to do over the next th nine days or six months, their charges may be dismissed or reduced. Um, the th level of intercept is the court common pleas, and that's where we intercept for the purposes of our mental health court and our um, vet court. The benefit I see it for being able to intercept at the court of common pleas is that you're able to take more serious case. You're able to take, um, and we've taken into our mental health court, we've taken in arsons, we've taken in serious assaults, um, we've taken gun cases into our, our veterans court, but we're able to supervise them over a longer period of time. And I, I neglected to man mention when I was talking about the members that in our problem-solving court, and as you'll find, and I've talked to people across the state in problem-solving courts, the DA is the gatekeeper, because typically are the in, the entity that is making a determination as to what charges are going to be filed or what's taking place and and what will be allowed in uh, mental health or veterans court. And we found that over the over years, as we've accepted more and more uh, serious cases with cesses, and that we've accepted people arsons that have successfully completed the uh, mental health court program and have not reoffended, that the DB becomes more and more comfortable with playing cases in mental health and veterans court. It's, those, those have become the courts for those that are in the criminal justice system. When you had cases in the past and you said to yourself, well, what am I going to do with this individual? What do I do with this case? The answer now often becomes, well, what becomes, we can put them in mental health court or we can put them in veterans court if they're, if they're a veteran. They've become a very effective, effective alternative. The fourth level of intercept is at the reentry level, and it's my understanding. And Judge Wood Skipper, I'm not going to steal her thunder. He, he her, her mental health court for the most part, or actually, begins with as, as a reentry court. Um, a little bit of a side: Pennsylvania has recently, or is it, is piloting a cup, three programs in three penitentiaries to be able to. Um, enter veterans into the community or to be able to more effectively re the veterans. And um, with that in mind, I, I may be talking to my colleague about about the re-entry court at Intercept 4 and, and adding that component to our veterans court. And the fifth level of the Intercept model is in the community. Denied. 
I'll try and go through here, is the criteria for eligibility for mental health court. You can they have to be 18 years of age or older in access one diagnosis, which may be schizophrenia, it may be bipolar. Um, their, their assessment is that human services. Um, they must consent to be in the program. Mental health is a voluntary program. Um, if they choose not to be in the program, well, that's fine. They would just go through the, the normal court system. Um, they need to get an, an assessment approval by human services public defender approval and the district attorney approval, as well as victim consent. And we thought, we thought victim consent would be something that would be difficult to obtain, but once victims are apprised of what a person has to go through when they're in mental health or veterans court, and that is the increased level of supervision, they perhaps have to come to court on a more frequent basis, they have to um, drug test it on a more, more frequent basis, meet with the probation on a more frequent basis, ever since we've had that explained to our victims, we have not had a victim in mental health court while I was there, nor one in veterans court, that there has been an objection to the individual coming into the court. As you can see, for a veteran, the, the um, issue is a little bit more different, uh, not much though, and they either need an access one diagnosis, um, and we've determined that for the purposes of that court, um, PTS would be an access one diagnosis, or having served in, in combat would also be, or in a combat situation would also be sufficient for for the, the, the veteran to qualify. Crime eligibility, we accept most misdemeanors and felonies. We do not accept homicide or sexual offenders. And it, it's interesting, the crime types are going to be different for, for mental health than for veterans court. Um, we found that in, in, in veterans court, so there are more assaultive type of cases, more gun cases, more domestic violence kind of cases that that, that are uh, referred to the court. And another interesting aside, anecdotally, it's my belief that many of the a large portion of the cases in veterans court are referred to veterans court by the police officers that are involved in the the arrest of the individual. The mechanics of a mental health in veterans court. There are two types of sessions. There is a B or a non-jury adjudication into the court, 99% are negotiated pleas, um, and, are, and are often plea bargains, and that's where the individual gets the benefit of the DA's agreement to perhaps reducing charges uh, pre-adjudication. And we conduct what, what are known review hearings, and that is where we're, we're taking them through their, their period of time and see how they go through, how they succeed or don't succeed in the court, and it's reflected by the type of review. A positive review is they're meeting all goals, and, and they're going through treatment. Uh, they're clean in terms of drug and alcohol. Um, they've got housing or placement. Uh, a negative is, is, is when they're missing meetings, they're reoffending, or there's positive urines. And a neutral is when they, they perhaps have the beginning of a negative, and in between time that they had that uh, negative review in their next court hearing, they've turned things around, and, and they're maybe clean at that point, they're, they're, either, or they're back in treatment, or they're back on their vacations, or, or anything anything like that. Um, proceeding a review hearing is an in-chambers team review of all the matters on the agenda prior to the courtroom proceeding. We take each individual's case, and we discuss each individual's case as to what the approach we want to take in terms of whether or not we want to have them... Um, go in treatment or whether we would have them go into rehab if they have a negative review or um, how they're doing in terms of a positive review. Maybe we want to try and, and, and offer them some rewards as, as they're continuing with positive reviews, as you'll see further down the line in, in, in another um, slide. Conditions may be they comply with all aspects of a service plan. The service plan is prepared in mental health court by justice-related services, and it's a contract. Essentially, it's a contract. And part of the contract will be you must take all prescribed medications. You must attend all treatment. You must frame from the use of illegal substances, and you must submit to urine and drug screens. In veterans' court, the service plan is essentially prepared by the um, veterans' outreach worker. And again, it's a similar type of uh, program here. And this is the continuum of sanctions. If it's a, if it's a negative sanction, um, start by increasing the reporting to probation, increase drug screening. Um, we may have to pay person in jail for for an afternoon or for, or for a weekend just to let them know how how serious we are in terms of in terms of correcting the problem. Um, they may be remanded to inpatient treatment or placed on electronic monitoring, or may have their current probation period uh, revoked, or that 
to incur curfew or other loss of liberties. The ultimate sin, unfortunately, is having to have an individual um, incarcerated in and or re removed from the um, from the court. The reward an increase in length between reporting to the court and probation, loosening of restrictions part of the service plan. Um, after they're eligible for graduation, after they halfway complete their probation, and once they do graduate, they receive a gift card, a graduation certificate, and for the re veteran, they receive a challenge coin. This, some of the successes have been that. Um, we uh, worked with, as you can see there, the numbers in mental health court over a three-year period of time have expanded from 85 to well over 400 participants. And veterans courts, which began in 2009, has served approximately 150 veterans to date. Um, and again, as I indicated, we worked with the prosecutor, the DA's office, to take more serious cases that have resulted in, again, resulted in, again a savings uh, with less uh, hospital or incarceration days and greater dollar savings. lower recidivism rate, and developing peer support and peer training for the veterans and those in mental health court. Some challenges, um, we're, we're trying to do more with less as the courts and as the need goes. Um, our veterans court is an example of doing more with less. Um, we received no additional um, dollars to implement um, our veterans court. Um, I volunteered more time. The DA agreed to volunteer more time for its assistant DA, the same with the probation and all the players that, that are that are involved. And again, I talked about one of the challenges had been, although we're, we've, we've, I don't want to say overcome it, but we've done well in, in dealing with it and maintaining trust and collaboration among the team, team members. And housing, as I indicated earlier, is always an issue that needs to be resolved. We continue to work with that uh, with the hope to be more effective in our placement in, in housing. And also um, public education, letting people know that these courts really do work. I want Thank you. Thank you, Judge Zipol. Appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to add one thing. When, when the judge was talking about uh, the sense sequential intercept model in the cross-system mapping, um, that's something that uh, PCC and the Department of Public Welfare, we sort of split from where we have a contract for we call for a center for excellence, and they in fact go out to the counties that have active CJABs or criminal justice advisory boards, which were developed under Phil's committee, and they in turn um, provide clinical assistance, and they take those counties through that, that system mapping um, thing effort, where they bring in an ex additional in individuals from behavioral health to help them look for where the gaps are in the system and, uh, and then prioritize really what their needs are. And then they could come back to PCCD uh, for additional funding, or we work through the technical support provider to help them provide aid to help them overcome some of their, some of their challenges. Um, our next speaker is, uh, is Judge Wood Skipper. Um, Honorable uh, Shell Wood Skipper was appointed uh, by former Governor Tom Ridge to the Court Common Pleas for Judicial District of Pennsylvania. Um, this is obviously in Philadelphia. Uh, the judge was subsequently elected to her second year term, and Judge Wood Skipper brings honesty, commitment, and certainly fairness to the bench. Judge Wood Skipper has been instrumental in creating and overseeing innovative programs in the cr criminal division of the Court of Common Pleas that have reduced prison population, increased efficiency in the processing of criminal cases. She also presides over the newly created First Judicial District Mental Health Court and at the SMART Strategic Management Arc Readiness Trial Room just for the South Division, I'm sure I'll explain what this all means, and newly created zone courts. The judge also serves as a member of the Judicial Education Committee, and she was appointed by Gover Gover Governor Rendell to the State Council for Interstate Compact for Adult Offenders, and was appointed by the late Justice Cappy to the Pennsylvania Sentence Commission, and she was reappointed to this position by Justice Castillo. Um, the judge is also a member of Judge Atola's Mental Health Advisory Commission of the PCCD. All right, Linda, for that kind introduction. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the Judicial District Mental Health Court, which is Pennsylvania's first reentry mental health court. And our motto really is justice, treatment, and public safety. First, talk about the, the need and the demand 
in for this mental health court here in Philadelphia. Philadelphia uh, had, has an extraordinary demand for these mental health services. In 2002, over 76,000 individuals uh, received mental health services in the state. Instituted 50.2 persons served per 1,000 persons uh, compared to the entire state rate of 22.8 per 1,000 people served. So also had served a large number of people who suffer with multiple disabilities and co-occurring disorders. This includes the 17% who have both uh, health and intellectual disabilities, about 32% who have mental health and substance abuse disabilities. With this critical need in mind, a, a study was conducted back in 2007, and of the 240 inmates who were housed in the prison, it was determined that there was a great uh, need and demand for behavioral health treatment of these inmates who had serious mental uh, illnesses, diagnoses. Currently, there are about 27, over 27 percent of the inmates in the prison who the behavior health caseload, and this is an increase from 2011 by about over 7 percent. There are also about 17 percent or so who are diagnosed with serious mental illnesses, They're suffering from, from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depressive disorder. So about 80% of the inmates who are listed on this mental health caseload who have serious mental illness diagnosis as well as a co-occurring diagnosis that I've talked about previously. So with this backdrop of information, Justice uh, James Fitzgerald, who was the administrative judge in the trial division in Philadelphia at the time, appointed Judge Renee Caldwell Hughes to address this issue. In August of 2007, the Philadelphia prison population hit over 9,000 inmates. And it was estimated that about 1,200 of these inmates uh, were identified as having serious mental illnesses. Hughes convened a working group in September of 2007, which was informally referred to as the Forensic Community Treatment Team Work Group, to try to brainstorm about the uh, best practices and alternatives to incarceration in order to be more effective in addressing the treatment needs of the defendants who were incarcerated but who had serious mental illnesses. This group grew into a collaborative project. And between the First Judicial District, uh, the Probation Department, the Defender's Office, the District Attorney's Office, uh, probation and parole, the prison, the court administration, and plus uh, case management teams and treatment teams, we moved towards a system to develop a protocol for navigating these defendants through uh, the criminal justice system. In this collaboration, one key factor was developed, and that was the PFAC team, known as the Philadelphia Forensic Assertive Community Treatment Team. During the process, uh, the court received a planning grant from PCCD, and under that planning grant, the mental health court was opened in July of 2009. So on uh, that collaboration, I guess the importance of that collaboration is together the experience and influence of the justice partners who can bring their own individual uh, experience to the table. It also gives you the opportunity for buy-in because if you have a seat at the table and you have input, you're willing to open doors and resources and services uh, to those offenders who may be in need. It also showed that there was a common goal and purpose. And I indicated our model was uh, justice, treatment, and public safety. So we combine all of those goals in an effort to improve outcomes. It helps to address the what I call the WFM, what's in it for me principle, because if you're sitting at the table, you can determine what's in it for you and have input as to what's in it for you. It also gives accountability not only to the defendant but to all the justice partners who are involved. So it's really just found that the treatment in prison was less beneficial than 
could be provided on the outside. And that inadequate treatment led to repeat offenders. The project was designed uh, a collaborative approach to basically provide wraparound, intensive wraparound services and treatment and individual, individualized probation and supervision. To individuals who are placed into a high level of supervision in exchange for placed into treatment facilities outside of the prison system. The team would go into the prison while the individual is still incarcerated and begin to assess what the needs are and to determine what the appropriate uh, treatment level would be for this individual. So the program are to facilitate the reentry of these offenders uh, back into society with supervised community treatment settings. We provide for them, uh, we look at all and assess what their needs are, which may include not only treatment, but housing, uh, training on benefits, having community support for services with, uh, for defendants who have mental illnesses. The key, goal, obviously, is to reduce recidivism, so we don't have the revolving door of individuals who are committing crime because, largely because of mental health issues, going in and out of prison, not getting the appropriate treatment that is needed, being let back out without the appropriate support, and then finding themselves back in prison again. It also helps to develop a more effective communication between the criminal justice partner and the mental health systems. Ultimately, it leads to the preservation of public safety. The structure of our court. This. We worked right when we began this program. We set up with one track, which was the PFAC track. Uh, we've now moved to six different tracks, and our court has expanded greatly since its inception in 2009. Uh, the tracks are on the level of care that the individual uh, may need, and eligibility requirements for each track uh, depends on which track will be received. The assisted community treatment uh, track is the track that has the highest level of care. And these individuals would are receiving uh, within 38 hours from the release or when the referral is made, they receive case management services, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a nurse, a th and a therapist. And all of the treatment teams is to provide services that include not only housing, vocational and educational training, clinical and drug and alcohol uh, benefits, as well as medical benefits as well. In each of the treatment teams, uh, the blended enhancement case management and the blended case management team, all by these types of supports. Veterans track are for individuals who are uh, veterans, and their services are provided through the Veterans Administration. The risk alternative service track, it's really what I call the catch-all track, and the individuals who do not fit into any of the other track are supervised under this that track. Some of these individuals do have case management services. Some don't qualify because of a variety of different means, and we may put other supports in place for them. This track is our competency assessment track. These are individuals, uh, defendants, whose cases are moved from other judges' caseloads because they are incompetent to either proceed to trial, sentencing, or violation hearings. They come into our courtroom in mental health court where, we, it's, we, where, where I do commitment orders under the Mental Health Procedures Act, and we attempt to restore them back to competency so that they can proceed with their legal matter. A large percentage of these individuals actually end up resolving their case while in mental health court. So we actually are able to do that without sending them back to their original courtroom. People who are eligible to participate in mental health court uh, must either be serving or sentence, be serving a sentence or awaiting a sentencing or wanting to be paroled as a result of a violation matter. We are now at this point also including people who want to plead guilty to their criminal offense and enter mental health court as a condition of their sentence. Individuals participating in mental health court also must be Medicaid eligible. Uh, they must have at least 12 to 18 months of supervision remaining on their sentence to
to give us an opportunity to effectively work with them in our court. Uh, the defendant must be willing to comply with court supervision and case management services that have been selected through the mental health providers. Individuals who participate in uh, mental health court also we come to status court. And some of this is very repetitive of what Judge Zatola just explained to you because much of mental health court is modeled after the Allegheny County Court. So we have screening meetings prior to each court hearing with the team that includes the public defender, the district attorney, the treatment team, the court, the administrators, and we sit down and we talk about each individual to determine what the best course of action will be. Most times, by the time we get to court, everyone is on the same page. We all know exactly what is going to happen. Ultimately, if there's no agreement, as such, I make all the final determinations. In our court, our mental health court has a designated probation officer. That probation officer is assigned to each offender and sentence supervision over each of these individuals. The probation officer is required to communicate with the treatment team and with the court as to any information concerning the complaint with probation and with the conditions of its sentence. As we have moved forward with our program, some of the key successes include reducing recidivism, being able to expand our court. As I've indicated, we've expanded from the one track that we initially started with under the PCC D grant and the six grants that we now have. We also have a graduate in our program an individual who successfully completed mental health court who are actually operating his own recovery program. And often we get reports from him on individuals who are in our mental health court. One that Judge Zatola mentioned was that they do graduation ceremonies. In our mental health court, we do goal achievement ceremonies. As an integral part of each person's plan, the treat team is required along with the defendant to start setting goals. And the goals can be very simple goals, you know, that they become medication compliant, that they really take their medications on their own, that they uh, are able to come to court by themselves and things of that nature. And so because we believe that mental health uh, and mental illness is something that you never really graduate from, we do go achievement ceremonies and we celebrate the successes of individuals who meet of goals that have been set for them. And we work with them to get them into a position where they can be successful either in independent living or with monitoring their mental health issues. <clears throat> some of the challenges are some of the same things I think that Judge Sadola has mentioned. Um, now it's housing, because many of these individuals who are coming out of custody, they don't have permanent housing. Sometimes you don't have families who are interested in supporting uh, these individuals uh, from both a moral and a uh, financial perspective. We have uh, obviously budget issues across the county, particularly in the court system, and with all of our justice partners that include the, P the public defender's office, uh, district attorney's office, the prison. And so our system's resources are somewhat limited. There are also sometimes challenges between confidentiality in the between the systems. Sometimes the systems, from a technology standpoint, don't speak to each other, or because of confidentiality issues, some information isn't, uh, frankly, relayed. Also depends on uh, the consumer to make medical and psych sometimes make medical and psychiatric decisions when the team may have a different approach and the consumer may not agree with that. Uh, there are also court priorities versus treatment priorities. You know, we are paramount, we are a criminal justice system, and so we are paramount in our interest in make sure, making sure that we are protecting the public. And sometimes protecting the public may not uh, comport with the treatment priorities that are developed by the team. Stability is another issue with the staffing shortages among our justice partners, uh, we don't often have uh, staff 
to do all of the things that we need to get done in a timely manner. And so we deal with these issues on, on a daily basis and try to do many workarounds. But the advantages of mental health court are that it's more efficient because the court resources are freed up for other judges and other folks to handle other things in the system while we are putting individuals who have these issues into one courtroom. It also provides for consistency and an effective oversight and disposition of sometimes these very difficult cases. It provides for a more successful transition for those defendants who are suffering from man mental illnesses uh, and who may receive treatment in lieu of incarceration. It provides more opportunities for treatment and for those op those that treatment to be more successful as you have the hammer of the court, which ensures compliance. Does again reduce recidivism because defendants learn to manage their lives more successfully. To the inception of mental health court in 2009, we had saved over 20,000 incarceration days and over $2 million in cost savings. Certainly, though, I think it's the benefits that the individuals receive. We've had individuals uh, who have been successful in achieving their educational goals, getting the GEDs, reuniting with families, uh, getting into independent housing, having their supervision on their criminal case terminated early, uh, going to college. Uh, we have individuals who get permission to go out of town. We have one individual in particular who has been doing so well in the program and will probably be terminated early from his criminal supervision, but as a reward who we are permitting to go on a cruise next month. We have an individual who I spoke of who is running his own recovery uh, center, and he has been very su successful in doing that. And it gives the individuals in the program the opportunity Opportunity, opportunity to witness. You can successfully uh, complete this program, uh, go beyond your criminal needs, and move on to live, hopefully, a fruitful, crime-free life while dealing with the mental health issues and the other issues that you may have. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. I'll pass the ball back now to Linda. Thank you so much, everybody. This is Cynthia again with the Justice Center. Um, a little bit different than what we normally do on our Q&As for our webinars. We've actually put together a number of questions that we would like to ask the panel um, of speakers all together. I know that on most webinars, this is when we lose a lot of people and a lot of people will drop off um, because the questions tend to not be all that relevant or interesting to the entire audience. But what we've done today is we've worked on um, developing some questions that we think would be very relevant to jurisdictions that are putting together their own initiatives, either at a state level or at a county level or even at a project-specific level. Um, so I'm going to turn this back to Linda, um, and she's going to be asking both um, judges and Phil as well some of the questions that you're going to see on your screen. And then we got about halfway through. We have had a number of questions that have come in from um, the participants. Um, if you have not already gotten a chance to type a question into us, please do go ahead and do that in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen under the Q&A box. So Linda's going to start with a moderated conversation between the participants, and then about halfway through we'll ask some of the questions that have come in, and then we'll go back to a little bit more of a conversation. Um, so Linda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I'll turn out to, uh, to the judges. How was collaboration really key to uh, the successful implementation of your court? This is Judge Whitskipper. I would say it was, it's imperative because we want to have the buy-in for the justice partners and with the day's office, just like in uh, Pittsburgh, and really the final say as to which individuals and which charges will be permitted to uh, participate in mental health court, uh, everyone needs to sort of be on the same page. And we've had a, a, a lot of success with the district attorneys who are involved, who are very compassionate while they are still looking for the needs of the public in terms of public safety. They recognize that this is a, a mechanism for ensuring, or at least helping to ensure that individuals who are committing these crimes because of mental health issues where they haven't had sufficient treatment and monitoring and with the additional supervision of the court and status listings and the rewards and sanctions program that we utilize as well and having all 
participants involved in what's happening to each individual when there are problems or issues, it makes the system work that much better. And that includes not only probation, uh, the prison, the, the public defender or the defense lawyer, but all of the stakeholders who are involved in this. And that, that collaboration just makes this program work that much better. I See, I ask you the same question. I would echo what Judge Wood Skipper had, had, had just said. Um, collaboration is very, very important. It, it, it's key. But I think collaboration is facilitated by the fact that the key players see how effective and how this process is working as compared to what was not working. The old process in many of these cases was almost a catch and release. The individual is arrested. They're, they're placed in the jail. They're released. They're no treatment. They're rearrested. The same thing goes. It's a revolving door. and and, and for the DA and for the police and for, for and for those who are paying for the incarceration dollars, um, they realized it was futile. The catch and release process futile. So they came to the table and they're and they're buying, as, as Judge Wood Skipper said, what's in it for me? Well, what's in it for you is your your jail population will decrease. These people will be treated. They will not be reoffending as they have in the past. And, and as I've indicated with the DA being the gatekeeper as it is in Philadelphia, they're seeing that they can they can these problem-solving courts with more serious cases in the past where they would be worrying about where to place that individual or what to do with that case when there would be sympathetic, sympathetic aspects of the individual that committed the crime, but the crime would be one of those, oh boy, it's an arson, we can't take take that arson and take a chance of putting that person on probation, with the assurances that, that we have extra uh, extra probation officers, extra reporting to your probation officer, more eyes watching these individuals, that, that helps them want to buy in. Um, for instance, court, it became easy for me because we had already established mental health court and, and, and the players, the collaborators were able to see how effective that was and, and they, they rushed to the table to start a veterans court. Okay, Linda, this is Cynthia. Um, I'd like to ask if I can just jump in really fast and ask a follow-up question to both um, judges. Um, I work with a lot of grantees that are around the country that are in the process of setting up brand new collaborations. And I know that a question that I'm always getting and I have for you guys um, about your collaboration is, when you guys first started your collaborations, did you have any partners that just wouldn't come to the table at all? This might not have been, I know that the climate in a lot of different places um, has been evolving, so it might not be an issue for you guys and that's fine. I'm just wondering if you had any stakeholders that it took a really long time to bring to the table. For me or for us here, I don't think it took a long time to get the stakeholders to the table. It took maybe a little longer time to convince them that they have the right table and that they should be at the table. Um, here we've always had a willingness for people to sit down and, and, and to talk and we to reach to reach an agreement. Things start small. I mean, our, our collaboration here in terms of the type of cases and type of numbers that we took in each of these courts was, was small, but um, they, they grew as, as time passed because of the the people in saw how effective they were and how they worked. And, and I must say that I have not had an issue where someone has refused to attend a meeting that they were asked to attend. I would agree. I think in, in Philadelphia, this initiative actually started in municipal court under just, uh, Judge President Judge Nyfield, where it's already a system where they are looking at mental health individuals in municipal court and averting a lot of these cases. So this is really an outgrowth of that. And I think the hard, it wasn't the hardest thing to get them to the table was to agree what kinds of cases we could do because obviously there's always the thought that this should all be version. And I think the compromise was that we go to reentry because that was the end that we could get from all of the justice partners at the time. But then while we are still a reentry court, we've gotten uh, the stakeholders to agree to permit us to allow folks to decide to plead actually and to participate in the health court as a result of that. Many of them, and if the district attorney's office agrees to give them a county sentence, and then we can parole them to an appropriate mental health uh, treatment plan and supervision in a mental health court. So there has been some outgrowth and some evolving in the thinking in terms of where we should go and the types of charges that should be included. If I could say uh, from a criminal justice advisor, report perspective. Uh, when we uh, began our process 18 years ago, there was an awful lot of one-to-one uh, -one conversations and work to uh, convince people uh, that we, we needed to uh, form this uh, committee, which was very new at the time, uh, and we needed to keep people at the table. And uh, that came along very well. I think the 
the, the things that happened were there were some people who uh, were uh, concerned if they were at the table, would they be losing some of their power, some of their individual control? Um, we quickly tried to eliminate those types of concerns. That uh, you know, it was it was really uh, respecting everyone's individual agency, whether it's the DA's office or Human Services, and supporting them. But the fact that people would be at the table would bring a lot of people there who previously didn't have the chance to participate. Thank you so much. It sounds like a general theme for everybody is that um, some things take just a matter of time to get everything up and running. And, well, Skipper, I think you made an excellent point about sort of st starting smaller um, and getting people to feel more comfortable with the and then starting to expand it. it. Sort of leads into the next question about you know how you really got support and buy-in. And I, I, Judge, I thought I sort of asked you the same question. I mean, do you, was there any any types of challenges that you really had to overcome in order to get the support and buy-in from some of the various stakeholders that you needed? I think as time passed and all of the, as all of the parties that were involved realized how how effective the were um, that they began to to the the, the process and, and and wouldn't hesitate in, in in referring certain cases. I mean, I indicated with the, the police officers, the police officers refer many of the veterans court cases. Um, because they saw, as in mental health court and as veterans court began, that slowly but surely it was effective, and and I think that's that's part of the way that we were able to get the support. And and I, and I agree with Phil. Often you have a lot of individual conversations to to explain to people um, what you what you hope to have happen at a meeting. You know, we're going to invite you to this meeting, and here's what we're going to be talking about. So someone at least has a sense of what's going to be taking place, and, and you're able to allay perhaps some of those fears or concerns that they may have prior to them even getting to the table. When the, so that when they're at the table, um, you can have more beneficial conversations. I think a lot of credit goes to to the judge too. When you have you know judicial leadership, I think it's a lot easier to get these types of initiatives implemented as well. Um, it, another question about some of the philosophical differences between some of the stakeholders, both from the criminal justice side and the health and human services side. I just know from personal experience when we're working with the Department of Public Welfare, they certainly have different acronyms in the criminal justice system. So they don't even know what, what each other are talking about. Did you encounter that when you were um, implementing your, your programs? I do encounter that somewhat, trying to have a, a universal language and where everyone's on the same page about, you know, what do, what do I mean by treatment? What do you mean by, you know, a, a, a certain community treatment team? What, how is that different than a normal PVAC team? I mean, so there is, I think, some difference in language and trying to make sure we are, we're talking about the same thing at the same time. And I think we've come because, one, we have these individuals involved and our collaborative process is an education process for all of us. So our court terminology may be different from the clinical terminology, or it may be the same word. Uh, and so we've learned to uh, deal in language and understanding what we each mean when we say something. And Did also, you find this, that yeah. also in this day and age of you need to do more with less, you know, and and, and the human services. I guess side recognizing or seeing that a lot of people that 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 that, that shouldn't be in jail in their estimation are now in jail or in jail too long. Seeing that an unlikely partner in the past, the criminal justice system, has to be a partner now. We have to work with them. And the same with the VA. The VA, as a judge, used to be a different entity where you would perhaps order this person to receive this type of treatment or order this person to go to this type of facility. And in the past, the VA would 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 often ignore. I think they've recognized the, 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 the need in order to be able to help their veterans as a return and, and those who become justice involved that we need to now be a partner um, with something, entity that we were not a partner in the past. That's the criminal justice system. And I must say that in, in the beginning, and it still continues, the acronym battle with the VA is, is really a, 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 a tough battle. There's a lot of terminology and a lot of numbers and words used that, that I have to stop in the middle of a session and say, please, you know, Translate that for me, or, or speak that non-military. Um, but I'm really convinced that that everyone is recognizing that these partnerships are good partnerships once you sit at the table and begin talking. And so, in the CJAB, and your work with the Delaware County CJAB as well as 
from um, your work on the um, CJAC committee. What, what are some of the barriers and challenges that, that I think you've had to overcome and get these CJABs and these planning committees established? Because I think they're really the foundation for uh, problem-solving courts and other types of uh, diversionary programs in the counties. Well, I think, Linda, that the, and the judges said it previously, uh, you have to develop trust, and you really have to develop relationships. I mean, really working relationships where people from the human services and criminal justice field uh, can feel comfortable uh, in working together. And sometimes that's letting down your guard. Sometimes that's letting down, uh, you know, uh, these are problems we're having in the criminal justice system, whether it's a supervision issue or uh, a, a resource issue. And the same thing with our uh, human services folks in terms of <clears throat> they're trying to manage budgets that just don't deal with the criminal justice population but other people in the county in need. So they're trying to push out those dollars um, and be very judicious of, about that. So, you know, there, there are challenges. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm really pleased with the way that service and behavioral health people work closely with our court for and, and with, with the prison, especially with the behavioral health liaisons we have uh, to really uh, maximize what we can do. But these are areas that, that thoroughly in these tough financial times are, are really uh, prone towards uh, uh, discord, and we're, we're fortunate not to have that at the moment. Great. Hey, Linda. Well, um, it's Cynthia. Um, it's about... 17 minutes after 3, and there's a few questions that have come in that I think um, would be really great for the whole audience. Um, so if we can just sort of take a pause for a second and I can ask them, ask of those in a row, um, that would be great, and then we'll get back to the questions that are on the screen. Okay, so the first question that came in, and I've just typed it into the chat box so everyone should be able to see it. Um, it sounds like the mental health court partners are not adequately funded to meet the needs of the court. Has the implementation of a mental health court led to efforts on the county level to devote more resources to, men to the mental health system treatment wraparound services in general? And that sounds like it's a question probably for the judges and also Phil as well, I think. And you guys will see it in your chat box if you need to see what I just said again. I mean, PCD uses federal funds to help establish um, the planning for the courts and some of these programs and also the original, the implementation of them. But, um, but certainly the treatment, the dollars to support treatment, uh, that's provided um, through the counties, through state or federal funds within the counties, and then in turn have to sustain them. So I'll kick it to the judges to answer um, some of those questions. But clearly you need drug treatment and drug and DUI courts, and you certainly need treatment, um, mental health treatment in the mental health um, courts. I certainly believe that there is support uh, from a philosophical standpoint in terms of uh, mental health court and the need for treatment and resources. But I think from a county level, we're constantly faced with the issue of limited resources. Uh, the same, folks basically competing for the same types of services and resources, and trying to determine who gives them when. And then you couple that with the wide budget issues where uh, the Department of Human Resources and Behavioral Health budget gets cut, and that directly impacts the services that can be provided at a county level. So there's always that concern, and there's always that um, about when and how and if services can be provided, and it's something that we constantly face with each court listing. And, and to uh, at a county level, um, sometimes when you look at the percentages of, of vendors and the percentages of services uh, going in certain areas, that we're talking about a completely smaller group of people receiving much needed services. But oftentimes there's the concern about the general population of offenders and uh, uh, you know and how much money is is allocated in in those areas in terms of supervision and and resources. So there is a little push and pull there, I think, sometimes uh, uh, be, because of it. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's so important that we've got some tremendous data in terms of success uh, working with uh, people in treatment court and veterans court. I agree with what the, 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 everyone else has said. We've not received any more dots toward the court itself in, in mental health or veterans court. And, and while there may be small efforts, we've sought 
um, other entities to be able to assist us, or other entities has come forward to be able to assist us in in, in some respect. I'll give you an example. Um, we while small, but to some people, it, it's a lot. We give a $25 gift card to someone when they have positive re review when they graduate. Um, our mental health or our veterans court and in the past years there's a, a police motorcycle association that's contributed a thousand dollars to mental health and the veterans court and each year to, to pay for these um pay for these um gift cards so you, you try and seek alternatives we're going to expand our veterans court to now two days a month and we're going to do that again with more with less everyone's just going to just buy more of their time do what you need to do we're not because of the, the budgetary issues, we're not seeing any increase in the dollars um, to each of the courts here in Allegheny County. Great. Let me um, ask another question. Um, how important do you think it would be for all probation parole officers, not just in the specialty courts, to be trained in military culture or traumatic brain injuries, or for mental health courts to be trained in CIT like police officers are across the board? Maybe I could go part of that. Um, we just on a a, 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 a conference call with our center of excellence this morning, and part of one of the initiatives that we're we're trying to do in, in Pennsylvania is to um, develop CIT or police training for for various uh, entities, and, and part of that would include also training with respect to veterans' issues. Some counties um, have the ability, or municipalities have the ability, to give the 40-hour CIT training um, for the police officers. There's also something called mental health first aid, which is a, a lesser 12-hour uh, program that is almost a little bit more than mental health 101 that is available. And we're trying across the Commonwealth to to obtain information from the counties as to what type of services that would best benefit their particular their particular needs. Um, we've had mental health first aid here to our probation officers. We're hoping to have um, mental health first aid to our court personnel, the people that can be informed about the issues and being able to recognize uh, someone that has a, a particular issue or is in crisis. The more people that are able to do that, the, the better we all are. If we're, we're, we're putting together sort of a strategic plan for how to deal with this to, to train police officers, probation. Department of Corrections is actually looking to train all the corrections officers, both at the state and county level. And what we're trying to do is across our state, there's some, some counties that do an excellent job at CIT training. So what we're doing is sort of inventorying our state and seeing where these effective pockets of CIT training are, and where some of the gaps are. And what we want to do is roll out CIT, which is only more extensive in terms of the number of hours, just a certain population, and then maybe the mental health first aid that the judge talked about, and then maybe some virtual training um, where people can get on for an hour or two hour courses. So we're trying to to run out based on um, the amount of time that's available and really to get the best bang for our buck. But all those populations certainly need that type of training. Great. Um, there's been a bunch of questions that have come in that it looks like we're not going to be able to get to answering, but we're going to be working um, with some of the panelists to figure out if we can either send out some um, written answers to people afterwards or find a place on our website to post them on. Um, what I'd like to do is um, jump back to Linda and look at some of the questions that are on the screen and continue with the conversation. Um, thank you. Um, so the question is around how, since we were talking bo earlier about funding, uh, you know, you, you receive grants, I know, from us to help get your initiative started. How are you able to really sustain those? And I know the judge talked about some donations, but, you know, how do you sustain those initiatives? And we hear this all the time at PCCD when we put federal dollars out. Well, I, I think uh, that all goes into buy, and I think with, with the grant from PCC that funded a probation officer, a public defender, uh, a, court, a mental health court coordinator. And so what happens with the public defender who now is no longer on grant, uh, see the value of the program, how it benefits their client, how we actually have so reconfigured their workload so that we have a more centralized location where they they have a separate mental health unit so that most of their lawyers now, instead of going to maybe 44 courtrooms in um, the CJC in the Criminal Justice Center, are now primarily going either to my courtroom for mental health court or to Judge Nyfeld's courtroom on the municipal court level. So it somehow streamlines their approach as well. And I think we, we have to view it that 
but as it's a cost safe mechanism for everyone and a more efficient way of dealing with the individuals and the system, and that's how we try to sell the sustainability of the fact that there is no other funding coming in to support the program. Look, Judge Wood Skipper. I mean, the, the, the buy-in comes after they see how effective it is, and they and they pick up the, they continue to pick up the tab for the individuals that were covered by the grant. And then you're always trying to do something something different. We're here with respect to our Veterans Court um, in, in discussions, and actually put, have developed a pretty solid plan with a local law school at a local university to have their certified law students. Who are prepared? Who are uh, permitted to appear before judges and represent individuals with a supervising lawyer? Uh, take over the representation of the veterans in in veterans court, thereby uh, freeing up some dollars that the county would normally have to expend for a public defender or counsel to represent them. So you're always looking for for different and more innovative ways to create these partnerships. I mean, it's a partnership between the courts and a, in, in a university's law school, which seems to be a natural partnership, but it's not a partnership that ex- existed here in the past with. Respect respect to the veterans. So you're always looking for something different to do to, to, sustain, to sustain your your court. Phil, do you want to add anything about the work of your C-job or some of the other C-jobs? Right, and I think that uh, having worked on courts budgets for many years uh, and working with our judges and, and our county council in, in the budget process, uh, you know, the number one thing that you're looking for is, you know, can you cost justify something? And, and that comes down to its effectiveness and documentation. And uh, we've been fortunate to be able to sustain a number of originally grant-funded uh, positions. I mentioned the four behavioral health liaisons, uh, the probation people working uh, with our treatment court and veterans court, um, you know, have been picked up on the county's budget. Uh, that's really the kind of the argument, you know, and I think that uh, some of our judges have done a, Judge Hazel uh, has done a tremendous job in uh, providing documentation uh, in this area. And, and probably this is importantly the fact that month to month the county council representative, the county's executive director in Delaware County, uh, Mary Ann Grace, attends virtually every meeting. So there's a lot of education that goes on beforehand so that there's a, it's a much easier uh, presentation in terms of uh, cost justifying uh, the work that you're doing. It doesn't mean that it's not tough and, and, uh, and, and maybe getting tougher, but at least uh, uh, you know what what you're spending on and you know the value that you're getting from it. There's just a oh, I, say, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, I'll ask each, each um the judges and Phil what what recommendations do you have for some of the participants for how to build these type of uh, uh collaborative initiatives? What would you say your, you know, recommendations would be? Don't stop. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. everybody to the table and be open to the conversation. And, and find who the uh, cheerleaders are, the people that are really uh, into this and were willing to uh, uh, put their heart and soul into uh, uh, helping to develop it. Because I, I surely know listening to both the judges, they, the kind of time and commitment they have put into this is certainly uh, above and beyond the call of duty in, in many cases. And I would add, um, my old boss, who was a CEO of Pennsylvania, used to say, chunk it, chunk it. Start small, small things established, celebrate those successes with all the participants, expand programs, celebrate those successes with the participants, and continue to grow it. I think we have to be realistic in what you can actually get done. Great. Um, this has been really trick. I know that there's been a number of questions that we haven't gotten to, um, and we will um, – figure out a way to get some of those answers and, and some of that information out to everybody. Um, this concludes today our webinar on fostering criminal justice mental health collaborations, building lasting partnerships. I wanted to say thank you to all of you for attending and who's participated, participated and a big thank you to the Bureau of Justice Assistance for sponsoring this event. And of course, a very big thank you to our presenters, Linda Rosenberg, Phil Diani, the Honorable Judge Satola, and Honorable Sheila Wood Skipper. A recording of this presentation, along with the slides, will be available early, early next week at our website, which is www.consensusproject.org, which is on your screen right now. And finally, when you leave this event, a brief survey of the webinar will pop up on your screen, and we would very much appreciate your feedback. Thank you, everybody, for your participation today.